I'm John Haig, and I am uh, the co-director of the Mosava Romani Center for Business and Government uh, here at the Kennedy School, and uh, also a lecturer in public policy. We are extremely fortunate today. Um, we have with us Megan Green and um, Adam Tooze. Um, Megan is a research fellow, a senior, senior fellow within the center. Uh, she's been doing fantastic work basically on broad macroeconomic issues. Part of our work right now is on narrowing the gap, theory versus reality for drivers of inequality. Um, and we're all looking forward to her book when it comes out. Um, and I'll let her introduce um, Adam. Uh, Adam is an historian at Columbia, but, but she can go into more detail. And Megan in particular uh, focuses on global macroeconomics. She was the um, Chief uh, Global Chief Economist at Manalife John Hancock Asset Management. She's uh, had her own uh, kind of macroeconomic consulting practice in London. Uh, she was in the Economist uh, Intelligence un uh, Unit. Uh, she writes a monthly column now for the Financial Times. And obviously, um, there's a lot of demand right now. The title of the talk today is Coronavirus, the Response to Recovery. Um, and the other side. And I think we all would love to know the answer to that. And uh, I'm not sure anybody really has the answer, but, but uh, I think it's gonna be an interesting conversation. I do wanna say just um, one uh, little uh, comment. Uh, obviously these are incredibly unusual times. I, and I, I don't ever remember anything of this nature and magnitude occurring, even the financial crisis uh, of 2008. Uh, does not seem to, this seems, what's, what's happening now seems to pale in that context. And the, most of our Romani Center for Business and Government really wants to keep our seminar series going, our processes going, uh, make all of our research available. Um, I'm gonna make a short plug, Chris Avery, uh, who's affiliated with the center, just came out with a paper today in the NBER, talking about all the different models um, and the pros and cons of those different models. And we're gonna try to build uh, I think a capacity within the center to provide um, working papers and other kinds of information related to the coronavirus and in particular the coronavirus, the economy and business. Um, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Megan, um, let her introduce Adam and uh, we'll go from there. But thank you all for joining us. I hope you're all safe and healthy um, and hopefully um, uh, uh, taking all of this in stride as best you can. Megan, it's all yours. Thanks, John. Um, let me introduce Adam, Adam quickly. Um, Adam's a professor of history at Columbia University, um, and he also runs the European Institute there. Uh, at, he's written the book Crashed, How a Decade of Financial Crises Changed the World, and I'm curious to hear how he might update that given this crisis um, at some point. And Adam hails from the UK and also from Heidelberg in Germany, but is now based in the US. So he has a real global perspective. Um, so Adam and I are both going to give introductory remarks for about 10 minutes each. Um, Adam's going to focus on uh, most of the world and I'll focus on the US. And then we'll go ahead and open it up to Q&A. Um, really quickly, a housekeeping note, the way that you can submit questions is through the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. So you can hit that and type in your questions and I'll go ahead and sift through them and try to group them thematically. Um, so hopefully we can have a productive discussion over this next hour. Um, let me go ahead and turn it over to Adam for his comments first. Well, thank you, Megan. Thank you, John, for, for that introduction and setting us up so nicely. It's a real pleasure to be here. I hope everyone can hear okay. We gotta be good on the acoustic, good, excellent. So, um, yeah, I mean, as John says, it is difficult to remember anything like this in our experience previously. And I, I think he's right that in many respects, this does dwarf the shock of 2008, though we might talk about the specifics of that. But one of the things that makes this so singular, and I think truly unprecedented in history, is the aspect of it that uh, French President uh, Macron alluded to in his now well-known interview in the Financial Times last week, where he referred to the shock as an anthropological shock. Now, Macron is given to big words, and you know the, the, the transcript of the interview is something I recommend everyone who has the time read. It's quite the long read. Um, very different, shall we say, in mode of statesmanship from what we're familiar with on this side of the Atlantic at this particular moment. But I think the, 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 S, the, the real tough and important fact around which that idea of this as an anthropological shock is centered is that this truly is as close to a universal and simultaneous experience 
deeply impactful. Not like where were you during the World Cup when Maradona shot his goal or in fact when JFK was shot, but what were you doing during this crisis is a meaningful question for us from here, from wherever we are on this Harvard webinar, to the street hawkers of Delhi or you know the, the, the bidonville of any African shantytown. Everyone is confronted with this question simultaneously. The ILO estimates that 81% of the global workforce is currently operating on one or other type of lockdown. That's 2.7 billion people. We think about 1.3 billion young people have been furloughed out of education, more or less simultaneously. And that's just sui generis. We've never had an economic, political, social, cultural shock quite like that before. It had to start somewhere, though. And I thought what I would start by doing is just actually rolling us back to the beginning. Because as Megan said, we've got a division of labor and she's going to talk about the US. I'll talk about ROW. But this crisis did originate, of course, in China. And, and I think it's interesting to think about that, not just from an economic, sorry, not just from a political and epidemiological point of view, because that muckraking is going to go on forever. But it's also interesting to think about it economically. Um, because in the markets, if you go back over the economic coverage, were freaked out by this event more or less immediately from the 20th to the 23rd of January, when it becomes clear that Beijing is going to be acting. And why are they concerned? I can see Megan like humming and hawing, maybe not freaked out. Why are they concerned? They're concerned because though for many of us, Wuhan and Hubei weren't exactly top of stack. If you're a watcher of the Chinese economy, this is a powerful and important industrial hub. And what Beijing was doing was not something the Chinese regime does routinely. There's a kind of orientalism in us imagining that the Chinese regime you know, routinely has the power to confine its part. Nonsense. Like, they've never done anything like this before. No one had attempted to stop as large a piece of any economy in its tracks as the Chinese were about to do. It took their advisors by surprise. She picked the most radical of three options that he was offered. That's at least the narrative the CCP is spinning right now. And the results were, were catastrophic for the Chinese economy pretty quickly. And so even if the Chinese had succeeded at containment fully and everyone else had acted as promptly as some of its neighbors did, it was pretty clear by February that we were facing what from the point of view of the world economy is very bad news. In other words, a very rapid slowdown in China. Uh, and it's worth, I think, remembering that as the beginning, even under the best case scenario, this was going to be much worse than SARS in 2003. Um, and there's a big question about whether China is going to be able to pull itself out of the slump, which it has for the first time entered since they've started publishing quarterly GDP numbers. This is the first quarter where we're actually seeing negative growth across China. And if you look at Hubei, Hubei province, which is after all the relevant comparator, not all of the Chinese economy, but Hubei is the relevant comparator for Italy, for instance, roughly the same size, roughly the same intensity of epidemic. The numbers for Hubei province show a 40% fall in, in, in quarterly GDP first quarter, right? So that, if you like, is what the, the epidemic looks like when it's out of control in China. So that is an analogue, I think, for us to be thinking about. It's very misleading, I think, to take any national numbers you see for China and use those as a way of thinking about projectual recovery tracks for the rest of the world. That sugarcoats the pill, basically, because that only that's taking a much larger aggregate. Let's focus in. So for a big part of the Chinese economy, the shock was immediate, it was massive, it already sent shockloads to the rest of the world, and for Hubei, it remains a catastrophe. So that's sort of the opener. The, 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 the epidemic then, of course, and this is when the markets really began to lose and become extremely anxious, when it became clear that it had spread very widely, and notably to Italy, and this becomes clear really in the last week of February, and then as we head towards the national shutdown in Italy on the 8th, 9th, it becomes clear it's hit Europe badly and in a big part of the European economy and by a cruel twist of fate, the most fragile bit of the Eurozone, right? Italy and Italy's public debt, as everyone who's been following the Eurozone story knows, is the accident waiting to happen. Italy is precariously perched on the, bal on the balance of debt sustainability at 135% of GDP with very low interest rates. This is manageable with support from the ECB. This is manageable. If nominal GDP growth picked up a bit, it will be manageable. <laughs> but what no one had reckoned with was a huge real side, massive shock to the Italian economy, which is suddenly what became apparent um, in late February, early March. And that has triggered a debate about the governability and the survivability of the Eurozone, which is one of the huge fragilities in the global economy. Obviously, Europe is not top of stack for many people. It's not the most fashionable bit of the world economy. But the Eurozone is a very big piece of the global puzzle. It's a major trading power. 
and its financial system is large enough to be hugely systemically relevant, not to mention individual banks, which are part of that. And so the sort of risk which suddenly was revealed in Italy from late February to early March compounds the already evident sense that, as it were, the Chinese shock is, is very massive, is going to pull the ground out underneath the growth machine that we take for granted in East Asia. And um, the Eurozone, the spread of the pandemic to the Eurozone points to that fragility. And ever since, all the way down to the present day, the Eurozone really has been struggling over what its response is going to be. In a nutshell, the, so we can get on to the debate as quickly as possible, in a nutshell, there are two components, fiscal and monetary. The key one in terms of the immediate stabilisation is monetary kind of underplays it, which is bond market stabilisation by the major central bank, the opening up of a very large fiscal capacity for national governments, um, and if necessary, support for fragile banks by way of various types of generous liquidity provision, which all three of which essentially the ECB has been doing on a scale which is by its standards large, even more importantly with a speed which is by its standards urgent. The actual scale, because ECB has done big QE before, what's really remarkable this time around is that it's actually jumped in very, very quickly. Still modest by comparison to what the Fed's done, and, and Megan will talk about this, but nevertheless, there's been a response. And that has been crucial because what it's done, at least for a while, is to take much of the risk out of the sovereign debt market and to cause and to enable the Spanish and the Italians to mount very substantial responses to the crisis without worrying about their budgets overly. But the bigger question, of course, and the longer term question is out there, which is that if these states do the kind of response that's necessary, if they then subsequently engage in the kind of stimulus that will be necessary to restore their economies to working order, the impact, if the cost redounds onto their national budgets, will be dramatic in the order of 10 to 20 percent of GDP. And if you start at where Italy started from, this pushes you into a nosebleed kind of territory on debt sustainability and forces the question ever more directly of how do you stabilize that? Is this just going to end up on the balance sheet of the ECB? Is there um, some other more comprehensive fiscal solution? And that is being debated right now by video conference in Europe amongst the heads of government at the EU level today. And it's, it's in the long run, the, the risks here are very considerable because if uh, there is not a common financing mechanism and a common funding mechanism, then the consequences are likely to be that the Italian and Spanish efforts limp behind those of Germany, and this will tend to compound the already existing differences within the zone and make the politics of this complex union more and more difficult. In a nutshell, that is the, the sketch. And as that, as that sank in, and that sinks in pretty quickly in financial market times between the end of February and early March, as it became clear how dangerous this was going to be, spreads began to blow out the Italian sovereign debt. And a variety of other shocks began to percolate through the financial system. And I'm going to use this as a segue to the final point of my intervention, which is the shock began to spread very widely across the global economy. And it's important to understand how quickly this happened because it's well ahead of the actual epidemic. Whereas in China, the epidemic and the economic shock are kind of coterminous. And in the Italian and European case, likewise, the epidemic arrives, the lockdown arrives, and the financial pressure builds immediately on the heels of that. What we see in the emerging market world is huge pressure beginning to come down through the financial markets um, already in February for many of them with the gradual depreciations of their currencies, but then extremely intensely in March. Um, the headline instances of this were, of course, the commodity producers, the oil exporters, notably, um, which include several very fragile emerging market states. Um, which were hit by the China shock because China was the main driver of global oil demand. And so it was clear if China was having this slowdown, then the emerging market oil producers were going to be in the front line of a shock. And this is what triggers the famous blow up in OPEC, which happens over the same weekend as Italy moves towards a comprehensive national lockdown. But then as the IIF, the, 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 the Association of Global Banking and Finance has been tracking in its data in real time, Basically, there has been an avalanche of, of, of well, it's not the right word, a reverse, a huge draining sound as money has been sucked out of the emerging market economies and their currencies began to plunge. Uh, and much of the action in global political economy in March and April was about cushioning this impact. And that ranges from highly sophisticated interventions by actors like the Fed, which with counterparties like the Mexican Central Bank or the South Korean Central Bank can engage in essentially advanced economy style interactions by way of swap lines. Two at the bottom end, as was discussed in the spring week of the IMF and the World Bank last week, 
immediate debt moratoria for the lowest income countries. We're talking the Malis of this world, um, the Tanzanias, the low income countries, which are scrabbling their way onto the ladder of the global economy and have now seen that torn away by the collapse of tourism, the collapse of export demand and a panic driven shock to emerging market finance. Um, and what we are scrambling together is some sort of safety net for those weakest actors within the system because this shock exposes profound inequalities in the system. And I'll, I'll end by saying the outlook, particularly for those actors, as grim as it is in the advanced economies, I think is really grievous. And for marginal, large population, young population, high unemployment, commodity exporters, notably I'm thinking of the Algerias, the Nigerias, the Angolas of this world. We're talking about existential risks from this crisis um, because it's really just not obvious where they go. They earn 80% plus of their export revenue from oil and gas. Huge slices of their government revenue comes from that. They're being forced, Algeria is being forced into 30% budget cuts right now, right here, right now, in a, situ in a country which is still, in a sense, in the aftermath of the Arab Spring. So huge risks there. And their recovery, what does it depend on? Well, it depends on the recovery of the advanced economies. Um, it depends on the stabilization of their funding. Um, but it also crucially depends on China for their growth prospects, because China is the great engine of growth. And to conclude and to conclude where I began, the, the dog that in a sense has not barked in this story so far is, is the China stimulus, because we saw the China shutdown, we saw the massive Chinese effort to control the epidemic. We've seen the huge macroeconomic hit that that's delivered, but what we haven't seen from Beijing yet is anything like 2008. And we've not seen the no holds barred, pedal to the metal, monetary and fiscal stimulus. And the question I think has got to be, why not? And what does that point to? And I think that points to a really critical kind of, and with Michael Pettis here, um, you know, fragility in the Chinese financial system with regard to the sustainability of debt in China, uh, key weaknesses in sectors like real estate, and then also the memory of the 2015-2016 crisis when China saw huge exodus, uh, um, which even from China's position of enormous financial strength was, was a real shock, a trillion dollars basically drained out of their foreign exchange reserves. So in the background, I think, apart from the wait and see attitude that we're very, Beijing would be very wise to adopt in any case, are a series of fragilities that mean that it's not even, it's not clear where the growth locomotive is this time. And I'll end on that, on that note. Okay, thank you, Adam. Um, I'll focus a little bit more on the US. Um, the data that we've gotten out of the US is sparse at best since this crisis started. Um, we do know that we've had jobless claims for four weeks in a, no, uh, in a row, which have just been eye-watering. I mean, the charts look like someone hard-coded the wrong number into the end of them because it's, it's just off the charts. Um, we have lost about 26 and a half million jobs in four weeks. Just to put that into perspective, that's more jobs than we created since the global financial crisis combined. So we've wiped all of that out in just four weeks. Um, so it's hard to overstate how big the impact of this um, forced shutdown, this deliberate shutdown has been on the labor market. We've also gotten some PMI data. So uh, companies are asked how they're feeling about output and employment and new orders, input prices. Um, and we've seen the worst uh, results that we've ever had on record from that as well. So that's a gauge of activity, but also of confidence. And we have specific confidence indicators that have come out um, for consumers and businesses. And those have also just seen the bottom fall out of them. Um, if you look at professional forecasts, uh, Bloomberg puts together a survey of professional forecasters asking them what U.S. growth should be in the second quarter of this year. And they range from growth of 0.4% um, annualized to a contraction of 65%. Um, now, I spent a lifetime trying to forecast um, various economies. I have never seen such a huge range. And um, honestly, I think 0.4% growth, that's wildly optimistic. But anything between a contraction of 10% and 65%, you could really imagine. And that's already still a huge range. So I would, I would say that as economists, we're all looking at this and we're all kind of on quicksand. We don't know exactly where the bottom will be. We just know that we haven't found it yet and that we're certainly not there yet. Um, this is also echoed on the corporate side, right? So lots of companies have just canceled their guidance. Um, usually they offer guidance on what they expect will happen with profits and other things. And they've just said, you know what, we don't know. So we're just not gonna offer any anymore. So it's just to highlight how much uncertainty we've had 
with this downturn. Um, the policy response uh, has been really impressive, I will say, in the US in some ways. The Fed acted really quickly. Um, someone said to me, thank God we had the 2008 crisis. And I thought, well, what a weird thing to say. You know, the global financial crisis was awful. And he said, well, it helped the Fed figure out exactly what they needed to do much more quickly this time around, um, which I, I guess is fair enough. Uh, it's hard to overstate the distance that the Fed traveled in a really short period of time. Um, in, you know, announcing programs to buy corporate debt and muni bonds, for example, um, high yield ETFs. Uh, by way of example, I asked some Fed officials at the last Boston Fed conference a couple months ago about buying corporate debt. And, you know, they just looked at me like I had 40 heads. It was absolutely just not even on the table. And now they're already doing it. So the Fed stepped in really quickly. The fiscal response um, has been a, a lot slower. It's been huge um, to say as a percentage of GDP, if you leverage it up with Fed money, it's the biggest response we've seen actually anywhere globally, um, but it has taken a while to get through. So we've passed three rounds of fiscal stimulus measures. We're, we've half passed a fourth one and it should be passed later this week. Um, but that being said, I think it's probably not big enough. Um, and for what it's worth, um, it, it, we've got really top-down tools to get money to the pieces of the economy that desperately need it. That's, it's not easy to do. Um, and particularly when it comes to small businesses, I think there's been a lot left to, to be desired. We've created this small business lending program that turns into grants if companies uh, agree to keep people on their payroll. So that's an incentive to not lay people off. Um, but first of all, we've already run out of the money. Um, we've topped it up, but all that money has been pledged as well. Um, secondly, the average small business has about 27 days of cash buffer. Um, we've actually already been doing this for 27 days. For, for a lot of these small businesses and for employees as well, it's just a bit too late. Um, so I do think the idea has been with our policy response to freeze the economy for two months, roughly, and then contain the virus and defrost the economy um, the hope was that we would have a whole bunch of pent up demand, everyone would go out and spend and, and a year from now we'll have hardly remembered that this even exists. What we're finding increasingly is it's going to take a lot longer um, to go ahead and contain this virus. And also freezing the economy um, might not work, particularly if you have to do it for a lot longer than we thought. In terms of how we get out of this, um, there are a few proposals, certainly. Um, one is that we just go ahead and reopen the economy, and we've heard a lot about that, certainly from the president. Um, CBS just put out a poll, though, asking people, you know, if we opened up the economy tomorrow, would you feel comfortable doing a bunch of things? Um, so they asked, would you feel comfortable going to a bar or a restaurant? 71% of respondents said no. Would you feel comfortable getting on a plane? 85% of respondents said no. Would you feel comfortable going to a large event? 87% of respondents said no. I mean, can you imagine passing a hot dog down the road to a stranger in the bleachers at a baseball game? It's unfathomable now. So we could reopen the economy, but the reality is lots of people won't feel comfortable going back out. And I do think there is a question about how our behaviors have fundamentally changed as a result of this. Um, if you are used to getting takeout now because you've been doing it for the past month and you can all of a sudden go out, you might think, well, maybe I'll just get takeout again because I'm used to it. And you might go to restaurants, but not as frequently as you did before. If you used to go to the movie theater, you might think, I love going to the cinema, but I'm pretty used to Netflix now. So you might not go as often. And if you've got a, you know, just a 10% drop off in all those different areas, the, the long lasting impact on the economy would be huge. And so I do think that we need to think about that and also think about what industries just aren't ever coming back. Um, retail might be one of them. We've been calling for the death of retail for the past 10 years and it hasn't happened yet, but it might happen now. I can imagine a lot of these department stores might actually end up going under. So reopening the economy is one option, but I, I have big questions about how much that would work. I'm not sure people would really go out. And if they did, you would probably have a, a new surge in cases. So there's a human toll that you need to think about. And we might have intermittent lockdowns going um, further down the line. So I think a V-shaped recovery is very unlikely. A, a Nike swoosh with a zigzag on the end as we intermittently lock down, open up the economy, lock it down, open up again. I think that's pretty likely. That's not the best option, though. I think a much better option is testing everyone 
every two weeks. This is the proposal put forward by Paul Romer, an economist, and he said, you know, if you test everyone every two weeks, you'll know if they have it or not for sure, given the incubation period. And so anyone who has it, they're going to have to isolate and everyone else can go back to life as normal and we'll all feel confident about that. Um, the problem with that is you'd have to test 150 million people per week. Right now we can hardly test 1 million people per week. So unless we can vastly improve our testing capacity, it, it just seems implausible. Um, there's another issue with that in that you would have to police that, right? For people to feel confident that everyone who's out has been tested and doesn't have it, you'd need to know that people have been tested. And I don't think anyone's just gonna trust that everyone's doing it. So you would need to police that. and that opens the door to a much larger role for the state in our lives that I'm not sure people are really um, willing to accept at this point. Um, I do think there are some long lasting implications of this. Um, I mentioned some industries are just never coming back. I think digitization will happen a lot more. We'll probably continue to have a lot of Zoom seminars even once we can actually get together in a room together. Um, and they work better in some cases than meeting up in person as well. So I think that, you know, physical globalization might fall, but digital globalization should increase quite a lot. Um, and just on a, a positive note to finish with, I also think that maybe our um, concerns for our immediate communities might remain um, once this pandemic is over as well. So that's a bit of a silver lining. Um, I will finish it there, but I wanted to go ahead and start um, asking questions. I've gotten some through the Q&A chat, so thank you for submitting them. Again, to ask a question, you just hit the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen and type it in, and I'll sift through them and pose them to Adam and answer them myself. Um, I wanted to start off, though, by asking Adam um, a question that I'm alert, I alluded to in my introduction to him, because he, he's looked at financial crises a lot, and I think generally, we economists tend to think, well, central banks have really stepped in and done a great job, and so we probably don't need to worry about a crisis like the last one we saw. Um, we probably won't need to worry about a financial crisis with the banking sector having wholesale bailouts. Is that a correct assumption, Adam, or do you see there, there might be some potential for another financial crisis off the back of this, given all the losses that we'll see in bank loan books? You're still on mute. That that will be um, different from what we've seen so far. So we saw cri we saw symptoms of crisis in March, which because they triggered huge central bank reactions, and because markets like commercial paper, for instance, were shutting down, set off all of the two thousand and eight kind of scar tissue. Was you know this is okay. We well, I understand that's what. But of course, the origin of that was completely different. So in in 2007, eight, it was driven by a downturn in real estate, which, which the, 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 we're familiar with the story, and then redounded by way of big bank balance sheets, which turned out to be entirely tied up with this, into the question of Bear Stearns, Lehman, and so on. And, and we, haven't, we haven't seen that, that, that line of causation running through currently. Um, you know, the banks have even spun the story and said, you know, if only we'd had bigger balance sheets, some of the turbulence in the treasuries market that you're so worried about might not have happened because we could have been market makers and so you wouldn't have had to have stepped in and altogether all of that regulation you put in place after the last time was you know misguided because you've created liquidity problems frankly i think we'll we'll take our current risk balance i mean the, i mean because there are individual banks which came through 08 okay just about the jp morgans of this world but they compete in an ecosystem in which there will be bad players whose bank whose balance sheets are huge and over leveraged and dangerous and they then create a set of problems that we haven't had so far. What we've had so far is stress on basically various types of fund based. So people have described this as a financial markets crisis rather than a banking crisis. And some of the real damage there may still be working its way through. You know, the stories today about like massive downgrades, the slices of CLO, which are, you know, uh, collateralized loan obligations. They are, as it were, a close cousin of the things which blew up in 2007, eight, or in some senses directly the same type of product. There were stresses in the mortgage-backed securities market this time around as well, which the Fed stepped in rapidly to try and fix. But I agree, Megan. I mean, if we see, if we see a truly deep, fundamental macroeconomic recession, a comprehensive unemployment crisis, then of course you would expect that to feel through, feed through to bad loans. And th there's been a, you know, a remarkable surge in loss provisioning by almost all of the big American banks. 
um, to, I think, allow precisely for that. So I would expect there to be pressure on people who've invested in banks. I would expect the dividends to be minimal or non-existent. I'm not sure right now in the US, I see a 07, 08 type dynamic. Um, but obviously this is very early days. The drama has been so intense so quickly and there is an incredibly powerful correlation between debt delinquency and unemployment and the unemployment numbers have shot up. We haven't seen the debt delinquency numbers yet, yet. though there are, there are signs that, you know, lots of mortgages are essentially in abeyance right now. In Europe, I think that might even be a more serious issue going forward because we know the bank balance sheets in Europe are very weak. The absolutely last thing they needed was a new surge of non-performing loans and the absolutely last place they needed them was Italy. And that's precisely the scenario we're looking at. So there could be, again, I don't expect it necessarily to turn into the rolling, uncontrollable crisis of 07, 08, but working through the balance sheets of crippled banks could very well be a problem that Europe is talking about. The ECB has already launched a proposal and rapidly had pushback. The ECB is clearly thinking that it might need a bad bank to deal with this. Um, so, uh, yeah, it is, it is significantly different, um, in its shape. And that has in part to do with the way in which we squeeze some of the risk out of bank balance sheets. It then shows up somewhere else and has to be handled with a new set of instruments. There, sorry, I, I was muted. Um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> My powers to be. Um, and the world stopped, Megan. You <laughs> just thought you were being quiet, Megan. <laughs> we were shocked that you had nothing to say. No, no. Um, we've gotten a couple of questions about an exit strategy, both for the US, but also for <laughs> other economies. And I kind of laid out two. One is the intermittent shutdowns. Um, Another is the testing idea with some significant government intervention in our lives. I guess um, there is the introduce the serious police state to make sure that everyone who's sick is staying at home. That's another option, but I'm curious to hear what you think the most likely options are. And also you spoke to um, how unsynchronized this entire crisis has been globally. Is, is that a problem? Should we consider that in terms of how we exit? Well, I mean, it's been unsynchronized because in a sense, everything, you know, is, I mean, it, it, historically speaking, the rapidity with which everyone has been hit has been the dramatic thing. But even in that three month interval between, you know, uh, Wuhan and where we are now, the, there, is a, there is indeed a, a phased pattern. Um, the, the thing, the point that I thought that you made was incredibly powerful, and I think is, is likely to shape, as it were, the way we move forward from here, is that we shouldn't think of the shutdown as necessarily government driven either, even in the Chinese case, because the events coincided with their uh, annual New Year's holiday. And so in a sense, the Chinese economy slides into a spontaneous shutdown anyway in the last weeks of January and early February. And in that space, the government declared the shutdown because in a sense, the economy was shutting itself down for the holiday. If you look at, if you look at as you're saying, in Europe and the United States, the sectors which are most vulnerable were shutting down spontaneously. The restaurant bookings, the hotel bookings were collapsing before governments declared um, official shutdowns. I've been looking back over the reporting on the, on the auto industry. It's very interesting because the trade unions play a very powerful role in saying to manufacturers, look, We've got to shut because you can't keep our members safe. And then the manufacturers look at each other and go, well, you know what? My supply chain is broken down anyway because other plants have shut. And in case no one's buying any cars, so why go on making them when your workforce is saying it's dangerous to be here? So the, the model of the shutdown and therefore also exactly as you say, the model from the exit of the shutdown should not be thought of as in two state-centered terms. I mean, in New York, it's spectacularly obvious that they've never had any capacity to enforce the shutdown at all. Like, nothing would happen to you even today if you walked up and down the street and went up to people and coughed in their faces without a face mask. I mean, people would treat you as an antisocial idiot, but there'd be no enforcement. Um, so so there's, a real, there's a real sense in which we should not 
you know, we should not think there is a clearly a deliberate element and the pressure was there and governments were pushing. But this is has to be thought of as a sort of spontaneous social and economic adjustment to a new type of risk. The implication of that, I think, can cut two ways. One is there is the extreme caution model. But I think there is also a very powerful, let's blow caution to the winds, you know, in the end, I'm not going to die from this. The Florida beach scene, which is a more optimistic one, which is people can't wait to get really, you know, at some point, we're all going to say to ourselves, you know, I'm going to fancy my chances. I actually don't think I'll end up in hospital. This could just be a really bad cough. Damn it, I have to resume normality. And it's a play. It's, a, it's an extraordinarily fascinating natural test of our, the balance of those forces um, for certain sectors, which are highly dependent on high risk groups like opera, for instance. I, I don't expect their, the opera to be full. The audience for teen movies? I don't know if I was, I would be, I wouldn't, you know, relatively speaking, I would bet on a re, on a release of a teen movie this fall. <laughs> Sorry, I've muted again. Um, <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, I think you're, what you're saying is right, that we've all kind of shut down on our own spontaneously before governments told us to. Um, the policy response, the economic policy response has been overwhelming, I think we can say. In the U.S., also in many European countries, Germany has blown through all kinds of orthodoxies. Um, in terms of having a balanced budget, it turns out the Germans are very happy to spend as long as they save their own bacon with it, right? Um, not, not quite as willing when it comes to other countries. Um, in EM, we've seen some extraordinary moves as well, um, though maybe a bit less overwhelming. Um, what has been lost in all of this at the national level, I think, has been concerns about debt burdens and deficits. And I know in 2008-2009 when uh, we tried to come up with a package to bail out workers and companies and banks in particular, um, we thought we could you know, pass a lot and just get it passed quickly and then we'll do more later and by the time later came there was no political capital left to do more. Do you think we're going to see political capital and support for this kind of rescue wane as time goes on and even worse um, do you think at some point we're going to be talking about austerity measures again to try to dig ourselves out of this debt burden that we're all building up? Now you're muted. Oh, there we go. So <laughs> we're negotiating the limits of control here. Um, um, yes, debt. Um, you know, there's a glib answer to that on the American side. And in that glibness, there's a real truth, which is depends crucially on who wins the presidency in November. Um, because when you say that the momentum broke down, it's kind of a bit of a euphemism. Let's face it. When we say political capital was exhausted, how was it exhausted and by whom and in the struggle over what? And if we just concentrate on the US, it's crisply evident what the answer to this is, right? In that the GOP, if it puts its mind to it, is perfectly willing to publicly say that the main purpose of their function in Congress is to ensure that the Democratic incumbent has a one-term presidency. Mitch McConnell's words in 2009. And that's what they did to the Democratic administration. They voted, I think, to a man and woman against stimulus in January 2009 and voted almost unanimously for stimulus, much larger stimulus this time around. Um, and I think that that's a very important lesson. If Joe Biden wins the presidency, expect all hell to break loose the very next day, expect Fox's coverage. And there is a fantastic graph which shows this operating in November 2016. It looks at the frequency of Fox's mention of the word deficit and debt up to November 16 and then after. And it's one of our graphs now it just stops fox doesn't care about the deficit or debt anymore and as soon if and when joe biden wins the presidency expect them to care a great deal and for the gop to make this into a life and death issue on which they will crucify a democratic presidency so i i really do think it's as simple as that and why 2010 is the pivot is that they won control of congress and that's the moment from which onwards it becomes a dominating issue and twice we should remember after all 
they pushed America brink, to the brink of shutdown and were threatening technical default. And that's, after all, how Jerome Powell won his spurs. He's in the Fed right now because he was one of the few brave centrist Republicans who went to the people, the crazies, in the House and explained to them how serious this was. And it was that which caught the eye of Tim Geithner. And that's why he was put forward, because they were also blocking the appointment of Diamond to the Fed board because he wasn't properly qualified. And Geithner said, well, damn it, let's find a decent, sensible Republican that they might actually pass. And that's how Jerome Powell found his way into the Fed. So there are legacies of this. And I expect that tough as nails partisan politics to resume from the Republican side if they if they lose the presidency. Um, in the background, of course, there are real, there are real fundamental issues of, of doctrine. Um, there are people who are devoutly convinced that you know, government debt above a certain level is dangerous, that it creates hazards of various types, that it's an obstacle to democratic functioning. And then there are various other shades of conservatism, not as extraordinarily partisan and kind of bare knuckles as the GOP variety, but nevertheless very serious in their intent to squeeze the welfare state and entitlements and so on. And that's the kind of politics that operates in a very straightforward way in Germany as well. And Jens Weidmann of the Bundesbank has already said, you know, fine, spend now. But, but remember, folks, we're going to have to reconsolidate later. And it's precisely that awareness which drives the urgency of the debate in the Eurozone right now. Because let's be clear, if that is what happens, if we do tend towards that direction, if we do do a pivot to austerity, it will be crippling. Um, because the IMF's fiscal monitor, you know, predictions are remarkable. Like they expect the, adva the average advanced economy to have a debt level of 120% of GDP. So, you know, in a sense, by talking about Italy all the time, we're kind of, we're, we're treating this as though it were going to be an exceptional case, whereas in fact, the condition of the, the average advanced economy, and of course, making averages out of a small group is always in a sense deceptive, is Italy's in that number, but nevertheless, what that's telling us is that everyone is going to be dealing with really high levels of debt. If America's debt will be you know, higher than since World War II. The UK's debt will surge as well. And so then the question is really very fundamental questions are posed. And I think we have to be, we have to, weigh, we have to, we have to find ways of talking about imaginative ways of neutralizing this as a burden, as much on our politics as on our economies, because really it's sort of neutral with regard to the economy, so long as it continues to be serviced. It's just a set of monetary claims which are on the balance sheets of one lot of people as opposed to another lot of people. Um, if it translates into a vehicle for crushing fiscal policy, then it becomes a real drag on economic, on economic growth. What I'm trying to avoid saying is the word MMT. <laughs> or the I, words I MMT. Yeah. <laughs> but what I, I'm trying to avoid saying them because I think they're politically toxic. No, no one in their right mind who advocates MMMT position should ever say those words out loud. You know, because the next thing that anyone says is Zimbabwe, you know, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a discursive track that no one should play who's actually serious about neutralizing this as an issue. Don't make it into some great intellectual point that you want to be righteously intellectually correct about. Bury it. Because what that's, that's the functional upshot of that way of thinking is it doesn't matter and we shouldn't argue and care about it because there are lots of different ways of neutralizing this. And the GOP in its cynical, pragmatic soul knows that. You know, if Trump is re-elected, they will go on and they will not make a big deal out of it and it won't be a catastrophe. Yeah, and I think you bring up an important point when you talk about debt servicing. That's what matters is the debt servicing costs more than the debt burden. And right now, central banks globally have said, look, rates are going to be incredibly low for the foreseeable future. Um, I guess, you know, if we were to get inflation off the back of this and central banks were going to go ahead and respond to that, then debt servicing costs might end up being a problem. But, um, well, no, we should bow down before the monetary gods and say, thank you for, no, if we could have inflation of four or five percent, it would be the solution to all of our problems because it would be what we had in the fifties and sixties, little, little more, but it would help us to burn off these nominal claims. If you can stabilize it in that band, that, of course, is the real issue. Can you hold it there? But then we don't have the flywheels of an inflationary wage price spiral we, we used to have in the West. I mean, there was a great exchange on Twitter recently where Eric Lonergan, I think, came out and said, if you still got a wage price spiral, you're an emerging market. <laughs> you know? um, if your inflation rate, if your wage rate responds positively in, in some obvious way to your price level, you've still got the, you know, the fabric of militant trade unions, which, which, we, which we no longer have, right? So we might be in a position of a kind of technocratic nirvana where we can, where we can run a moderate inflation level, which would be a tax. It's just a general tax on everyone holding a nominal claim. 
And, and if the question is, how do we deal with this debt burden? That is the question, right? Either we keep postponing it by holding them on the central bank balance sheet, or we decide who pays. And a, an inflation tax is not an unreasonable way of doing it. Great. So you're not worried about inflation. I'm not either. So <laughs> yeah, a, it won't happen. This is the other thing is like, you know, <laughs> if only is the, you know, because we know how the, the central banks entered this crisis, all of them having deep internal soul searching conversations about their monetary policy framework, because none of them were able to hit a 2% inflation target, inflation target. Yeah. And, 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 you know, the Blanchards and so on of this world, former IMF chief economists were saying we should target four. And to which the realistic response was always, well, that's a lovely idea, but how do we get there? Yeah, great. Um, John, I know you have a question, so why don't you jump in here? Uh, thank you, Megan. Um, I won't comment on inflation. Megan and I just had that conversation earlier today. She knows I'm not actually particularly concerned about inflation. Um, but I do want to go through a couple points you made and then kind of get your perspective on how this will play out in the future. In particular, you know, you pointed out correctly, Adam, that this is a universal kind of global problem. It cuts across every asset, you know, of the, of the world. It cuts across geographies. It cuts across income classes. Um, and so it's universal. Um, the second thing is we're also seeing, as you pointed out, a breakdown in global supply chains. Um, and you're seeing problematic kind of linkages. And the third thing I would say is I'm hearing people say this is likely to be in waves. And it will be in waves both in geography and in time. Mm -hmm. If you go back and look at the 1918 Spanish pandemic and things that admittedly are very different today, but the first wave was now in the spring, the second wave came in the winter, and the third wave was again in the spring. And it was the third wave that was the most uh, problematic from a fatality, mortality uh, kind of perspective. So you got to figure it's going to come in waves. And what that does, I think, is push the world to become very nationalistic. And to your point, um, you know, at, at one level, if we could actually op act in a more integrated way and there were gov global governance mechanisms that it would enable that, we could have a more coherent and systemic response. But all of the pressures are pushing to nationalism. And it's not just nationalism at a federal level. It, you see it in the United States with the pressures between states and the federal government. And you see it to your point in Europe, you know, Italy and the EU and can the EU hold together? And so, so where does this leave us in terms of the governance mechanisms to really kind of address these um, mm. problems in a more systematic way? Maybe we just can't expect that to happen. Yeah. I thought the Governor Newsom of California's comment about California being a modernizing nation state of 40 million people was one of the more remarkable punchlines <laughs> to come out of this entire crisis. I mean, it felt, made you feel terrible to be, you know, left adrift amongst the 280 million stuck in the, you know, decaying wreck of a federal, failed federal project or something. Um, so, no, I agree. I mean, that, that kind of centrifugal force is, is very considerable. Um, I mean, I'm not a, you know, I'm by no means a supply chain expert, but I would have thought that one of the things that comes out of this is a sort of modular regionalization. I mean, I've been looking, like I've said, at the car industry, because it is the driver. I mean, the, the, the motor, motor vehicle industry is the most sophisticated and most large scale employer of complicated value chains. And, um, you know, the average modern car apparently involves 30,000 separate parts, which all have to be sourced from different, the different channels. So you can imagine the complexity of that and doing that over asynchronous shocks that are running across a system. But the fact of the matter is that VW, the largest global car producer, it's only factories which are currently producing and selling cars are in China. So it actually does have production up and running again in China. Interesting. Um, and so, you know, they, it, it remains a global company centered in Germany, of course, um, subject to funding pressures that run through European capital markets. And apparently VW is a major petitioner with the ECB in the ECB's policy of stabilizing corporate debt markets in Europe. So there's a very interesting connections, but ultimately the factories that are going and the showrooms that are open are in China. So if that's possible, it points to, you know, new models in which you would have corporate control R and D and perhaps capital markets and funding operating at a truly global level, global level, and then manufacturing being essentially regional, ma ma macro regional, which I think is broadly speaking, the model that operates within NAFTA as well. Right. So, 
you, yeah. you have these these clusters with car plants operating either on the Canadian or Mexican border of the U.S. So I think that that's probably a, it seems like a likely response. Um, um, so I, I, I'm not sure whether it points, obviously, for political entrepreneurs, I, I always want to stress agency here. I mean, this is a shock. Unlike climate change, it appears to have a national solution, if you like, a small scale regional solution. So it creates an opportunity for nationalist entrepreneurship. But that's what it is. Like, it's, it's an opportunity for people to engage in that kind of politics. It's not a structurally forced move. But as we've seen with Trump, you know, whatever it is, banging green, green card applications, like it's a, it's a total irrelevance, but hell, it makes for good politics at that moment. And that kind of exploitation, I think, is something that we clearly have to guard against. You see that in Italy right now with the uh, struggles over the ESM. It goes down into the technicalities. The Italian right wing have basically made the only immediately available crisis management mechanism politically toxic. And so you have the prime minister struggling back and forth, committing himself and backing away. Centrists are saying, no, don't be stupid. Look, this is a good mechanism. Let's use it. But Salvini has really made it poisonous. So there's a um, there's very, very complex politics to be played out case by case around each one of these instances. To my mind, everyone who is, has a stake and I'm going to be unabashed in my, my normative position in a cosmopolitanism, we should surely embrace this the other way around as an expression of a human totality that's that's unprecedented to date. And we should honor the fact that you know, no, very, no life essentially is too cheap right now in the world for national governments not to feel that they had to respond in a very dramatic way. I mean, for me, historically, Modi's decision to lock India down, as ramshackle as it may have been, is nevertheless, that's a historical turning point. Life in India has traditionally been at a discount, whether it was ruled by the Brits or the Mughals or after Indian independence. And for, Mo for Modi to say and to apologize in the way that he did, and I'm no great fan of Modi's politics, but nevertheless, you know, that speech where he says, you people must, you poor people must hate me now. What kind of a prime minister would do this to me? Like that, that kind of discourse is quite, is really historically surprising. And we should embrace that as a symptom and as a sign of, of our collective, you know, as this is a collective, the Chinese use this phrase a lot and a collective, a community of fate. Um, and, and, and that's what we are being exposed to. So I'm gonna follow up just real quickly or just make one quick point. What I find a little bit ironic and I agree with you is that part of global governance is gonna be derived from the private sector protecting its uh, global supply chains that it's established. In some ways they have more at stake or as much at stake in many ways as governments do. And the, the centrifugal force is pushing governments to be more nationalistic versus businesses which need to protect their businesses and therefore protect their supply chains. It's, it's an absolutely classic, classic liberal trope, right? <laughs> Governments, I mean, it's the absolutely, I mean, clearly it's totally naive and, and you know, unspoiled, but that's it's an absolutely classic claim on the part of du commerce, right? That if, 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 and this goes back to the struggles of liberals with absolutist regimes in the 18th century, that if only selfish, dynasties could get out of the way, then the, you know, the, the soft, the pleasant interchange of commerce, which is in some sense, you, know, you can see where liberal ideology picks up on this, but yes, of course, that's at some level true. Let me just, um, we're running out of time, but let me finish up with a forward looking question. And that's to say, kind of who's gonna pay for this war? Um, and how's mm -hmm. it gonna change the role that the state plays. I mean, we know that the NHS came out of a war. We know that social security came out of a war. Is it crazy to think that something might come out of this war, so to speak? What's gonna happen to taxes? Might we get a carbon tax? Might there be some opportunity for sustainability in here as well? Yeah, well, we've talked about the debt analogy. So, you know, you know my answer is let, let's, I mean, for heaven's sake, let's not start that, that, that question that way because if you do, I think it's political, it's politically toxic. But I mean, the force of your point is, of course, is, is very important. Like what clearly we have discovered, our dependence on public infrastructure and how ruinous it is if we don't have good public infrastructure and how we need more of it and we need reserve capacity and to subject it constantly to the test of is that an efficient use of resources. It, it, it is lethal when you're suddenly exposed to an unexpected shock for which you have no redundancy. Like all of those arguments are going to become incredibly compelling. Um, and we have seen also just the huge premium. And I'm not thinking of China so much as the South Koreas and the Taiwans of this world, the huge premium to be put on the ability of 
of you know, authorities to mobilize new technology in an efficient way. I mean, nothing about the South Korean response should surprise us if you look more broadly at indicators of modernity. That just looks like the quintessence of what an increasingly rich society should do with its resource. Spend enormously on research and development, spend on education, spend on infrastructure. It's kind of like at this point, all of those arguments become no brainers. Um, and this is just a demonstration of that. But then you, that by itself isn't enough because America had a great epidemiologist and was quite well prepared by any metric. Then of course, you also need a politics that actually listens and you need an administration that's alert. And, and we will have had the shock this time. But I, surely this, I, I, I mean, I'm predisposed. I'm pro my problem is I know how strongly I am biased towards this opinion anyway. Um, but, but I would have thought that this becomes compelling even to people of a rather different political persuasion. You know, it's, it seems to me that, that a right thinking centrist Republican at this point should be easily persuaded of the need to have reserve capacity stockpiles. It's not going to reach everyone, that argument, but it surely will reach a substantial fraction of the people who've come through this at the cutting edge. You know, people who've had responsibility at different levels. The, some of them, of course, will hew to a crazy denialist kind of line, but there are going to be folks that come out of here with credit, having run, especially at the state level, you know, reasonable operations to try and stabilize them. And that, that should be, to my mind, um, should, should leave one feeling that something positive might come out of this experience in that respect. But otherwise, yes, clearly it's, it's a call for more public infrastructure and for more capacity on the part of government. Yeah, and so before this all happened, a lot of us were out banging the drum on sustainability questions. You, oh, yeah. you most of all, I think. Yeah, I um, <laughs> is anyone going to care about that now? Um, or, you know, is that just going to fall by the wayside or is it going to become even more important? There are a lot of students who are asking. Yeah, if we don't care about that, it's going to kick us in the butt so hard. Like, we're just setting ourselves up. So this, you know, it was never a moralistic case for me. It was never about um, normatives. It's just look at the predictions. And they are telling us that catastrophic things will happen and catastrophic things in many parts of the world are already happening. Again, it's not putative. It's already, it's already in the present. I, I'm very, I, I'll make just three points really quickly. I, I, I think like I'm very loath for this to be exploited. I don't like the ambulance chasing rhetoric, which says this is an opportunity. I mean, if you're in the travel sector, if you're in service, this doesn't feel like an opportunity. This is a catastrophe and you want your life back and you want your life back quickly. And that is a completely reasonable position. It's small C conservative, but given the shock, who could possibly argue with that? So I'm extremely loath to engage in that. Here's my idea. This is a great moment to realize my idea. Enough already. Let's see whether we can't restore. However, this is giving us an X-ray of what a society which did suddenly shut down would look like and what would happen if we rapidly decarbonized. And we should sit up, smell coffee and learn very serious lessons about the structural changes in their costs. And I'm thinking not just about rich societies, but about the fragile emerging market economies like that don't have a place in a high carbon tax regime. Algeria might be shipping gas, but you know, the Venezuelas, the Colombias of this world, the high cost producers with fragile social systems, they don't have a role. They're not gonna be the people pumping the last barrel of oil. We need a plan and they need a plan for that scenario. And anyone who advocates decarbonization needs to take that seriously. But, and the third point is a very general one which is that at the beginning of this year, centrist, reformist, climate folks like, you know, I, I would describe myself as dismissed Extinction Rebellion, right? We they thought those people were crazy. The people who said we should shut down the economy right now to deal with the catastrophe. What is our answer now, right? Like faced with this challenge, society itself shut down and then governments ratified that decision and we have absorbed an absolutely huge macroeconomic hit, the depths of which we're not even aware of yet for what is, historically speaking, a warping in the ordinary path of death, right? I mean, this isn't fall dead in the street plague style death. This is a relatively minor perturbation in the demo demography. Tragic and serious, and that's why we've had taken the action that we have. In future, what we will not be able to do when somebody comes along with a radical proposal is say, oh, well, we can't do that. Think of the economy, stupid. Like, that is not going to be an adequate answer. <laughs> um, we will be able to say, well, look, last time we tried this, the costs were this and they seem excessive. That, that kind of answer will work. But that blanket, you know, that's unrealistic. All of that's gone out the window because our parameters of what's realistic have just been completely, completely blown out of the water. Yeah. Thank you so much, Adam. I can't thank you enough for your comments. And to John for hosting, we are almost staying on time in terms of ending. Um, so thank you to everyone who dialed in as well.